Hi guys, it's Rob here, and picking up where we left off, we were talking about object-oriented programming languages. Now, in object-oriented programming, data and instructions for processing that data are combined into a self-sufficient object that can be used in other programs. An object is a self-contained module consisting of pre-assembled programming code. When an object's data is to be processed, we're sending the message, right? And how the object's data is to be processed, the methods, right? So it contains information, okay, about how, about when an object's data is to be processed and how an object's data is to be processed. Now, visual programming, in contrast, or GUI-based pro programming, which is an unofficial term, right? Uh, we have application software, which solves a particular problem for the users. It's useful uh, for a specific task or entertainment, and we interact mainly with this type of software. Whereas system software enables application software to interact with computers, helps the computer manage internal and external resources, provides services to applications' needs, and interacts with the hardware. And you can see this diagram right here uh, further delineating the, the breakdown of it. Basically what this means is that you have the user, right, and he, he or she interacts with the application software, which is interacting with the system software, which is also interacting with the device drivers and utility programs, and that all of that is talking to the, and then the system software is taking that information and talking to the hardware. Now, types of data, we have documents, worksheets, and databases. Also important to note that free software might not be open source, for example, Internet Explorer. Cloud computing, computing is obtaining resources from a network of computers sitting around somewhere, and you pay only for the resources that you use. Now, the advantages of cloud computing include the flexibility and adaptability by rapid provisioning and reduced costs through sharing and centralization. Disadvantages are that users don't physically process their data, and security and privacy, uh, third-party security and privacy issues, legal rights are unclear, and they must have internet access. So to go over this very important diagram, which I brought up in the intro video, okay, we have layer one, which is the physical layer, layer two, which is the data link layer, layer three, which is the network layer, layer four, which is the transport layer, layer five, which is the application layer. When you're sending, you're going down from the application to the physical. When you're receiving, you're going up from the physical to the application. Of course, layer 5 is a higher layer, layer, layer 1 is a lower layer. So, going up and down, obviously, is, is based on these numbers here. Now, to connect to the Internet, you need an ISP, or Internet Service Provider, a means of connection, and an access device. Now, what does fault tolerance mean? It means the ability to continue an operation after a fault has occurred. So we're going to take a look at two principal structures of networks. One is client-server, and the other is peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, in peer-to-peer, -peer, all computers are equal. They directly communicate with one another without relying on servers. In client-server, you would have the client who's making the request for the information, and the server who has that information will send it out to the client. Now, here's a very important client-server di diagram. And guys, for those of you in NJIT's IT 101 course, hint, hint, this is probably going to be on the homework in one of your tests. So, the client, okay, makes an, makes an initial request, and the server's waiting. Then, the client's waiting for the result, and the server provides the service. Once the client has the service performed, it replies, and the server is waiting for another request. And this is how time increases. So, as time's increasing, you have the client, which reaches out, then you have the server, which provides the service. And then you have the client, which replies back after the service is done to let the server know that the service has been done. Now, a three-tier architecture means that there is a client, a mid-tier service, and a back-end service. Server, sorry, this shouldn't say service, this say server. Client, mid-tier server, and back-end server. So we have the client here. Then we have a server that does application processing and a server that does data management. And you can see these two talk to each other and these two talk to each other. So that's our three tiers. We have the client, the mid-tier server, the back-end server. And I'm going to leave you guys with that as food for thought. And in the next tutorial, we'll pick up where we left off. Thanks. Please don't forget to like and subscribe.